Proverbs chapter number 28. I'm just going to read one verse today. Verse number 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Now, I mean, that's probably, Brother Randy, one of the shortest verses we've ever read for a Sunday school lesson. But, verse number 9 of Proverbs 28. He that turneth away his ear. Well, what's that mean? It means voluntarily. Does not say that he is pulled away from the law. Doesn't say that he was carried away from the law. Because we know, for instance, we can look at Daniel. Daniel was carried away into captivity. But every morning he opened the windows of his house towards God's city, Jerusalem. His heart never left the homeland, even though he was carried away. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about somebody that turned away their ear. Now it doesn't say that they left, like the prodigal son. The prodigal son left the house of the father. This just says that they've turned away their ear. They still want to be around it, but they've just stopped listening to it. They're around whatever it is, and what it is in this case is the law. I can be in a room and tune you out. That's what this is talking about. You could be talking to me. We'd be the only two in the room. And if I try hard enough, I can tune you out. Or if I start thinking about something else, even though it may be something very important to me, it may be something that I really want to hear, but if something else grabs my attention, I can turn my ear from you, even though I'm looking you in the eye, even though I'm right across the table from you, right where I should be in order to have an audience, but yet I'm just not listening. Well, we've already said, what has this person, he that turneth away his ear, what doesn't he want to hear? The law. Now, the law, literally talking about the law that God delivered unto Moses on what God accepted as holiness and what God did not accept as holiness. Okay, well, in that case, those that don't want to understand what God requires for holiness, well, if they turn away their ear, they're not going to be looking for Christ. Because they think that they're enough. The law told us that we weren't. And the law proved that he was. He came to not destroy it, but to fulfill it as he taught. Well, in addition to that, what else is the law? Well, the law, perfect law of liberty. What is the perfect law of liberty? Christ personally saved you, and you have personal responsibility over your spirituality. Not your salvation, but your spirituality. Well, what does that mean? Soul liberty. As Paul said, all things are lawful, not all things are expedient. Although it may be lawful for you and I both to do the same thing, it may not be expedient for me, but it is expedient for you. The perfect law of liberty is black and white, but it's in the details. Thou shalt not bear false witness, or as a lot of times it's written on walls, thou shalt not lie. Right? That's pretty clear cut. The lie is not the truth. But what is expedient? That takes time. That takes more listening. Your ears have to be turned to the perfect law of liberty for a good amount of time before you understand what is expedient. Your ears have to be you know, devoted unto God for him to show you not only what is good, but what is that perfect will of God. Yes, right. It's our reasonable service to devote our bodies as a living, living sacrifice. But the extra mile is when not only do we say, Lord, I'm yours, but Lord, I want to do it the perfect way that you would have me to do it. The one that turns his ears away from the perfect law of liberty starts cutting corners. Or does things that are expedient to the flesh and not expedient to the cause of Christ? Well, what else is the law? Well, as I started to think about this, really the law is just the truth of God. Right? Because what was the original law in the Old Testament? It was to show us what God ex accepted as holiness. The law was God's standard. So whether New Testament or Old Testament, if God were to deliver an instruction unto you, is it not the law? 
God said it. If God said to do it and you don't do it, is that not a transgression of the law? Doesn't that fall under, that's why I have no other gods before me? Doesn't that fall under that we should worship Him and none else? That we should serve the Lord? Well, if we don't, we transgress the law. Well, what is instruction? Well, first off, there's the instruction of the Word, because this is the Word of God. Right? The very words of God to deliver the instruction unto man on what man should and should not do and how man should and should not do. Right. Certainly if we ignore that, we're ignoring the law of God. Yeah. But, by extrapolation, if you come to the house of God and you've turned your ears off for the entire service, well maybe not even the entire most of the time people don't turn their ears off for the singing, most of the time, people don't turn their ears off for the fellowship. Most of the time, people don't even turn their ears off for, you know, the announcements. There are people that will listen to the announcements, but when the most important part of the service, doing business with God, they tune out the preaching and they tune out the invitation. Is that not the law of God, that we should freely assemble as a collective, unified body of Christ without, you know wedges without divisions in the perfect harmony in spirit and in truth to one worship but also receive from God's under shepherd what God would instruct us or how God would edify us or how God would comfort us but if we tune it out the people that tune that out let's be honest they're not reading every day the ones that do it every service, now we're all guilty of tuning out the preacher at one point or another. But those that do it week in and week out, they have no concern for the instruction of God. They have no concern for the commandment that God would have them personally uphold. Let me give you an example. Did Luke, Luke wasn't an apostle, Luke was a doctor. He had esteem in the world of man, but he, he left all that. The beloved physician left all that he knew. And we, most of the time we find him tagging along with the Apostle Paul, documenting his life, interviewing others to present the most perfect account of first-hand witnesses collectively that has ever been publicized. Mark was Mark's account. Matthew was Matthew's account. John was John's account. And where two or three are in agreement on something, two or three witnesses... It should be taken as law. But Luke went and interviewed everybody that he could find that first hand saw Jesus. He left being a physician and became a historian. Well, God certainly could have used a godly physician. God certainly could have used someone with the education and with the social standing that Luke had in the city that he grew up or where he worked at. But Luke said, I don't want that. I want what God wants for me. God's commandment was document. Go. Encourage. I mean, the Apostle Paul wrote. He said, hey, Luke told me to tell y'all hi. What's that mean? Luke was with them at that church before. Or Luke had individually gone there and encouraged, edified, maybe taught them a little bit. I don't know. Maybe just told them about, hey, y'all want to hear what this guy told me about Jesus? He goes, and not just him, but a whole bunch of other people also. What is it? That was Luke embracing the commandment that God gave him. Most of the time people call it a burden. A personal instruction that God gave to you and that you personally believe only you can do it the way that God would want you to do it. If you receive such commandments as thou shalt not kill, if, well, we've got both song leaders here today, we'll do this. If God were to say, Brother Ray, I want you to lead singing on Sundays, and Brother Clint, I want you to lead singing on Wednesdays, if you don't do that, is that not a transgression of God's commandment toward you? It's not written for everyone, but it is written, take up thy cross and follow me. It is written, submit. It is written that we should serve in the house of God. But if we reject it, we reject the law. Well, very short verse. Yet we're already about 10 minutes into this thing. But, well, what's the 
consequences of tuning out the instructions of God, tuning out what God would have us to receive while we're at church, maybe even tuning out just godly fellowship. I mean, we can go over and look at Job's friends. They had good intentions, but they had tuned out everything that Job had lived before that, and they started listening to, well, one of his friends said that a spirit came by in the middle of the night and told him, doesn't say it was the spirit of God. They started turning into something else, and they turned their ears away from God. Then they start rebuking Job. They start accusing Job. They start questioning Job. What would you do that was so bad that God killed all your kids and took everything from you in one day? Job stood up and said, y'all a bunch of idiots. I live yesterday the same way that I lived every day before that. He said, nothing changed between me and God. But his friends, on the other hand, they turned their ear away from the law of God. They just started accepting anything. They went with good intentions, but they did a whole lot more harm than they did good. I mean, they sat there with them for a couple of days with nothing being said, day and night. But yet, because they had turned their ear from the law of God, they started rebuking a man that God called upright, perfect, who feared God and eschewed evil. They started attacking the one that was probably the brightest light that they had in their day and age. But don't worry, they did the same thing to Jesus. Well, we turn away our ear from the law. Even that man's prayer shall be abomination. Well, what is abomination? Well, the literal definition of abomination is something that you detest or that you abhor hate it is so against everything that you believe everything that is true that you cannot do anything but hate it it is your enemy because it exists you should detest your flesh because it is the enemy of your soul you should detest and Satan and all of his works should be an abomination unto you because it goes contrary to the holiness of God. Well, abomination also, by implication, anything that goes against the divine order or the desire or will of God. Now, it doesn't take much to go against the divine order of God. Some think that, you know, in order for it to be an abomination, it's got to be something really bad. No, I mean, it just has to go against what God said. It's that our mindset has gotten to the point that heresy doesn't seem as bad as it used to be. Heretics aren't called out and pointed out like they used to be. False teachers and false... Why? Because we have become desensitized to it. Abominations don't seem as bad because the things that in our mind are worse have become so mainstream sodomites are still an abomination but so is abortion right those that take the word of God and pervert it that's still an abomination the people that would usurp authority over the man of God in the eyes of God are an abomination the people that would do harm to the church of God or the people of God and prevent them from having harmony and unity and worshiping in spirit and truth, that's an abomination. It's not a misfortune. It's not an inconvenience. It is abomination. Abomination is more than just the things that make you sick to your stomach when you hear about them happening in the world. Abomination is anything that goes contrary to what God said. So first off, by implication, the reason this guy's praying abominations is because he doesn't know what God said. He's turned them, tuned them out. Tuned out the law. But see, it's not saying that his life will be an abomination. It's not saying that his innermost desires will be abomination. Because the heart's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. I don't even know what my own heart is capable of thinking. There are desires that my heart has that, praise be to God, I don't know, but would be an abomination. But it's not talking about those secret things that he doesn't even know about himself. 
It's saying it's prayer. It's not talking about the things that he does in secret. It's not talking about the way that he lives when he thinks he's got everybody else fooled. No, it's very prayer. So now we must dissect what prayer means. Well, what is prayer? Well, first off, prayer is communication with God. But see, this doesn't say that it's prayer towards God, although certainly it could be about the prayers that he prays to God. What else is a prayer? A prayer, as we said, is a conversation. It is your testimony. Every day you wake up and the way that you live shows other people what you pray or desire from God or desire from your life. Those that wake up and they go to church on Sunday, your neighbors know that you desire to go to church. Because they don't see you getting out and, you know, hopping in the car in pajamas and then coming back with a Dunkin' Donuts box. They see you dressed up in your Sunday best and then you're gone for a little bit and then you come back and then you go back again. When you get out of the car, you have your Bible because you didn't leave it on the pew with you. Your prayer, your conversation is made known through your actions. The desires of your heart are made... Where man's heart is, there's treasure shall be also. If you desire for the things of God, you will work out those deeds that bring you closer to laying up treasures in heaven. It is a part of who you are. Because, I mean, as a man thinketh, so is he. If your mind is set on heavenly things, you will do heavenly works. As James said, I will prove my faith by my works. Right? The thing that I am convinced of, because that's what faith is, you are so convinced by God that you will cling to it regardless of what happens. The things that your faith has had nailed down by the Word of God, by the preaching of God, by the Holy Spirit convincing or convicting you of it, those things become a part of you. You cannot separate them from yourself. That's why without faith it's impossible to please God. If you're not convinced of it, if you don't believe it, rain or shine, thick or thin, up or down, then you're not going to live it. So the man who's turned his ear from the law of God the way that he lives his life when he does communicate with God it'll be abomination it goes against what God desires okay, well now let's get into that communication with God the very prayer that he prays unto God but what is abomination it goes contrary to what God wants well if someone hasn't heard what will they desire but without faith it's impossible to please God so if you're asking for anything and you don't believe that one it's the will of God for you to pray it and two that God will perform it I mean we heard about it on Wednesday and it was in the devotion that I did on Wednesday he that comes to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him from the book of Hebrews What's that mean? If you ask and you're not convinced that God wants you to ask it and that God will perform it, you won't receive it. He may wink at your ignorance and do it for you regardless, but there will come a time that if you tune God out long enough, just because you pray that God give you your daily bread, why would God bless you with something that He'll use you or that you will use to do harm to Him? Well, God, you told me to cast all my cares upon you. Not if they're worldly cares. Right. Not if it's so that you can consume it upon your own lust. Because right. then you're asking a miss. You know what a miss means? You missed the mark by a whole bunch. You were cast out in the ocean. Right. That's what the word apocrypha means. That means better kept hidden away in a drawer where nobody will ever see it again. Those are all them books that the Catholics say that belong in between the Old and the New Testament. You know what all of those stories talk about? People that were amiss. There's one book. Here's the reason that the translators wrote Apocrypha on every page when they were translating the KJV. 
is because in one individual book, one guy died three different ways in three different time periods. It was in the book of Tobit. Also in that book, a so-called angel of God shows up and lies to a guy. But then that wasn't a messenger of God. But what is that? All of those are things that are amiss. They bring confusion and doubt and uncertainty to the reader. What happens when you tune out the law of God? Confusion, doubt, uncertainty. Why on earth would anybody believe that God would do for them if they don't get in here and truly understand how great He is? If they don't fellowship with the one that said he would stick closer than a brother, why would they cast their cares on one that they've never found out really does care for them? Right? Tuning out the law is more than just saying, well, this is what you should and this is what you shouldn't do. If you love right, you'll want to do it. You'll live right because you love them. Not because, well, I have to do it. No, I desire that because if I don't do it, then I don't have fellowship with the one that I love so much. But see, even the very prayer of the person that tunes out the law, their desires, their conversation, when they ask God something, if they ask without believing, it grieves God. You know what that means? It prevents God from doing what God desired. Abomination. You hinder God from doing what God desired. See, back in the day, if that were the case, they would have taken somebody out and stoned them. Because they didn't want that person hindering everybody else. Now it's the norm. They try to stone and criticize and crucify those that stand up and say, no, I'm going to do what God says I'm going to do. They are now the outcast. We're used to it was the abomination that was the outcast. And sometimes, depending on what God told them to do, for good measure, it wasn't just the person that committed it. It was everybody that was associated with them. Because chances were, if that person was the head of the household, he taught them to do the exact same thing. That if you learn the wrong way and it's etched into you, then there's nothing you can do for you. Only God can do for you. And if God hadn't by that point and you became abomination, they'd say, we don't want you anywhere near God's people. We don't want you anywhere near the things of God. We don't want you to where you can accidentally sneeze on the tabernacle and bring dishonor to God. God forbid you help drive one of the stakes that holds the tent up. But was it? They saw abomination as being a curse. That it de-elevated, it derailed everything that God wanted to do. Because there was something that was contrary to what they were all in. And anything that was out, they realized it pulled everybody out. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. But now we expect a few people to have what it takes so that everybody gets to enjoy the blessing. So when he gave it to me, I'm just going to say it. So if you were to kneel and pray, well, Lord, I pray that uh, you show Brother Doug everything that he needs to preach a good message on Sunday. Well, if you don't pray for God to show you everything that you need to see in the Word throughout the week, that's abomination. You're expecting another man to do and pull what God told you to pull. You're chucking your responsibility onto somebody else. That's abomination unto God. If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Well, if a man doesn't pull his own load in the eyes of God, he won't have a reward. If you're starving spiritually, when's the last time you got in here and looked for some ravens delivering some meat or an angel come showing up with a cake? Some manna from heaven? Maybe you were looking for fish and you open it up and oh hey, there's all the money to pay your taxes. What's the point? Abomination is more than just a deed. It is a lifestyle. If your very prayer is abomination, what do you think your deeds are? If you if simply not having the faith to believe that God can do what you're asking him for can be an abomination, how much more is it when you go against the things of God? 
when you do as unto the flesh. Because certainly there are those that pray ignorantly. Right? They don't know better if they're young Christians. God will sort that out. The Holy Ghost will take care of that. I'm talking about people that know better and just think they can get by with it. I'm talking about people that pray, well, Lord, I pray that you give Brother Doug the message that we all need to hear on Sunday, and then when they receive it, or when they hear it, they reject it and turn their ear from it. Doubly abomination. Because God, even though you didn't have enough the right faith, God answered it anyway, and then you rejected it. When you don't hear, your very life is an abomination because you grieve the Spirit that seals you, that indwells in you. Grieve not, quench not. So if I prevent the Holy Spirit from directing me, from using me, or from showing me what I do need to see, how much more can I bind the hands of God in my life? How much more can I dare God to chastise me or to remove me from the face of the earth? Because everything that I do is contrary to what He'd have me to do. It's not about doing the right thing. It's about doing what God says the right way. Just because I come to church doesn't mean I'm taking a box off. If I'm sitting there stubbed up on a log, if I'm sitting there and I'm angry or having a halt with a brother and I turn my ear from what's being done in the service, in the eyes of God, I wasn't there. Because I was here, but I was checked out. Just because you're watching the live stream doesn't mean that you're really listening. Just because you listen to so-called Christian music doesn't mean that you're really listening to the Word. doesn't mean that you're really... It, you can have whatever on in the background. It's just background noise. It's white noise. Just because it's playing doesn't mean it's doing you any good. Unless you actively get to thinking about what the song is singing about and then it draws you closer to God. It's not even singing the words. It's not even just listening to it and say, hmm, that, that was a good piece of music. No, the whole point of songs and spiritual songs, hymns, is that it gets our mind back on Him so that we draw closer to Him. Doesn't hurt the most of the time they're catchy and they get stuck in your head. In fact, on the way in, I was listening to Alan Jackson sing Standing on the Promises. Why? Because one, it's one of my favorite songs, and two, well, yeah. It did sound good. But I wasn't listening to it because it was Alan Jackson. I was listening because the promises of God were meant to be the foundation of our life. Well, if I were to reject it, the foundation of my life, abomination. Now, see... The real scary part of this verse is what's not written in this verse. People understood it back in the day. When this was penned down, they knew what God did to abomination. Y'all ever heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? You ever seen it? No, because that's what happens to abomination. Before, Lot, the Bible says that Lot looked and he saw the cities of the plain and they were as the very garden of God. They were so fruitful, so plentiful, that according to Moses, when God told him to write it down, he said, hey, Lot saw it, and Lot saw the garden of Eden. It made sense. Made sense. I don't have to, I don't have to be a shepherd no more. I could be a farmer. I could own a vineyard. I could get a big city job. But I don't have to labor every day. I can just go sit at the gate and judge. Makes sense. But in all of that, Job lost not only his he lost himself. He, according to God, Bible called Lot righteous. I mean, so Lot didn't live in wicked sin. Lot kept the commandments that he was taught. But because he had turned his ear from the instruction of God. The law hadn't even been written at that point, but the instruction of God. From the guidance of God. When he left everything that Abraham told him, taught him, he may have been doing it, 
but he was surrounded by abomination. When it's a personal thing, you allow abomination to go on around you, and you may just be caught up in the destruction because you were somewhere that God said you never should have been. Well, what's the point with that? America's not all the time, but most of the time, abomination. Even though, I don't know how I get, oh, I was watching Don Rickles roast uh, Reagan when he got elected. Yeah. And you know who was in the audience? Billy Graham. Everybody looked at Billy Graham and thought, Billy Graham, that's a great preacher, great man of God. Yeah, but if Billy Graham believed everything that he said on TV, he's in hell. Billy Graham said, and I quote, that there are many ways to heaven and not just Jesus. I've seen the... It wasn't on, like, you know, his network or anything. No, no, no. That was televised network cable news station. Why? Because he, he didn't want to offend anybody. Abomination. Well, he started off right. Well, many people start off right. Many people try to fake it right until they can get it the way that they want it. Some people can get along with something that they don't agree with until they're the one calling the shots and they can change it. Well, what is everything that we've got ties into? Abomination is not dealt with lightly by God. There can be personal destruction. There, let's look, hang on, let's look at the, the brothers of Joseph. It's only by the grace of God that they didn't get wiped off the map for what they did to Joseph because they still lived at the father's house. And God had made a promise to their father that Israel would be his chosen people. Well, we do find that for a very long time, until they got back to where Joseph was over in Egypt, handing out rations that he had, by the grace of God, saved up and stocked up for because he knew a famine was coming, they lived in famine for a long time before they came to Egypt. They tried everything that they knew how to do to get things to grow up out of the ground. Well, 11 patriarchs lived in absolute desolation for seven years because they junked the one that the Father bestowed a gift upon. He wasn't the eldest. He didn't have the birthright. He wasn't the one that was going to get a double portion. No, they just got jealous. Well, as a result of that abomination, they dealt not only dishonorably, they did wrong and then some by Joseph. And the afflictions and the suffering that he had, they had to reap in their own lives. No telling how much hardness came into their life because of what they did to their brother. But just because you think, well, I'm, I'm at Israel's house. I'm at God's house. I live where I'm supposed to be. God may not wipe you off the map, but you're going to have some hardness. I will remind you that when the angel of death passed over Egypt, that if the Israelites didn't take the blood of the lamb and paint it on the door, their firstborn died too. Just because you got a claim to a name doesn't mean that you can avoid all the responsibility. Abomination is still abomination. God may not wipe you off the map, but he may wipe everything that you have from the face of the earth. And you'll go to grab what you used to think was your most prized possession. It'll be sand just falling through your fingertips. Or, like Indiana Jones, you may pick up that little golden idol and the next thing you know, poison darts are shooting at you and the big rock's rolling down the tunnel. And if, uh, you know, Hollywood's any indicator, uh, that whip wouldn't have supported his weight, that branch would have cracked a whole lot sooner, and that stone probably would have rolled over him a long time ago. What am I saying? You don't stand a chance when you're trying to outrun God. True. It'll start with chastisement, but eventually it'll come to utter destruction because it'll turn your flesh over to destruction so that the soul might be saved. But when we look through the lens of 
well, what does the Bible say about abomination? Abomination is many things. Abomination is not called abomination anymore because people don't want to think that they're living as an abomination. People stopped preaching on it because they thought, well, I might offend somebody. Or people stopped preaching on it because they knew that they were guilty of it and they didn't want to talk about it. They got themselves a hobby horse or something. Christians stopped calling it out because, well, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. People stopped calling a spade a spade because maybe they like to hang out with some spades on their own free time. People stopped because they turned their ear from the law of God. You know what it all comes down to? Somebody's holding on to something that they say, this means more to me than what God desires in my life. It's abomination. It doesn't have to be a Babylonian garment. It could have been an Israeli garment that you're using for things other than what God intended it to be. Abomination. Why do you think that the high priest, if he didn't purify himself right, if he didn't put on the right apparel, if he didn't dress the right way when he took in that blood sacrifice to lay on the mercy seat, why do you think God killed him if he didn't do everything right? Because it was an abomination. He didn't follow the instructions of God. He didn't do as thus saith the Lord. But see, they had no word. They had some stone tablets. They had an oral history handed down for a long time. They had those that had seen the law that would come out into the temples and preach unto them what thus saith the Lord. But how much more? We, that even though everything's shut down, I guarantee you, you can get on Amazon, eBay, or any other online store, and you can order. You can go to our church app, order a Bible, and it'll be at your house in about three days. You don't even have to. You could get on the church app and read the entire Bible right there. It's right under the middle, and I think it's one over to the right is the Bible. It takes you right to the KJV 1611 website. There it is. You can even read it in Old English if you wanted to. It may take you a little bit because, you know, it's got all the funky letters that nowadays we don't use anymore. But what does... We've got not just the law. We've got everything that God ever intended us to have this side of heaven. To know what He says, to know how to live. So when we reject it, when we ignore it, when we come to the house of God and we just let it go in one ear and out the other, how much more of an abomination... There were those that did not... Noah, when he got off the ark, didn't know that the grape juice turned into fermented wine. But from that day forward, never drank it again. Well, we do know. We've read that story. We have the privilege and the blessing of thousands of years of hindsight behind us where it's 2020 that we can gain insight from those that before us were given as an end sample. We ought not have to learn the same lessons that Samson learned. But how many people do? But everything that they did that led them to the exact same spot that Samson got to? Abomination. We ought not have the same questions that Thomas had. Where he said, until I see the nail prints in his hand and thrust my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it. But when Jesus showed up and he offered him it, he fell on his face. It didn't even take him up on it. But how many people doubt? Only for God to show up and them to claim, yeah, I get it. But later on, John writes that Thomas called Didymus, meaning double-hearted. Yeah. Find me Thomas in Acts. Find me Thomas anywhere else in the New Testament. Well, he may have believed, but he never got all in. He may have accepted, well, okay, Jesus got up. But how do you go tell others about something, convince them of something that you're not convinced of? That you're not 100% on? Or that something else just means more to you? Anytime. Something comes before, it may be, you could throw a name on it, yeah, but it's idolatry. Or, well, it's just convenient that you know, I had to go do this and then I can just do the live stream. I don't care what you call it. 
You can give it a title. You can give it an explanation. You can give it a justification. But if it goes contrary to the will of God or the instruction of God or the word of God, abomination. And when God's people get back to accepting what God says and not accepting abomination, then God might show up and give revival. Then God might restore it to where we get to come back in fellowship. Maybe he'll wink at our ignorance, even if not everybody does. But those that do just start shining so bright that those that accept the bomb, you may not have to do it, but accepting it makes you also guilty of it. I've never understood those that say, well, homosexuals are just, you know, if you can be saved and still be a homosexual. Technically, but practically, I don't believe it can happen. Now, certainly a homosexual can get saved, but I don't believe a blood-washed individual can get so backslid on God that they can still desire the things of God and live that much of an abomination. The two are mutually exclusive. Because one embraces everything that God tells us not to, the things that are unnatural and perverse, and go against the way that God designed the human form and the world and the other of walking hand in hand with God can't do it man cannot serve two masters even if you used to serve one if the spirit's really down in here I believe that long before you ever got to that point he'd drive you insane you'd be in a loony bin taking lithium every day why? Because if he's, if he's really down here, it's really going to grieve your spirit to live a life like that. Yeah. Now, I know, Brother Ant, maybe I'm just, you know, ignorant of how much somebody can suppress the voice of God, but I've done it, and I didn't get nearly that far before I got so miserable I had to come back. Right. Why? Because when I live in abomination, I will be miserable. Yeah. That's what people don't understand. If you know right, if you saved, you blood washed, you've understood it, it's not out of ignorance, and you willingly do it, everything on the inside of you is going to be screaming to get back to what you don't want to do. You will literally go into zombie mode where you're just going through the motions to try and feel anything else except conviction, pain, because most of the time you're grieving yourself when you leave but then also just miserable when you're robbed of love, joy, peace, yeah. happiness, mercy, gentleness. Yeah. When you don't have the blessings of God in your life every day and you go to reach for them and all it is is a reminder of how you walked out on it, you're going to be miserable. Yeah. Yes, God's judgment will come one day and you may think, well, if I can get a long enough time of good, maybe it'll be worth it. One, God help you. Yeah. But two... You don't understand the entire time. It's not going to be, there's pleasure in sin for a season by promise you this, going to be a whole lot of ash yeah. that food turns into in your mouth. Yeah. I mean, it's just a chapter before this that to the man that's full, honey doesn't taste good. But to the starving, even the bitter thing tastes sweet. Right, you can have the filet mignon of filet mignons, which I never really liked. I don't get it. Give me a porterhouse or a T-bone, right? But, or a ribeye. But anyway, point being, you can have the best of the best, but if on the inside you're satisfied with the world, all those succulent and great and precious things of God just turn into soot in your mouth. And when you're so miserable that you go out into the world and all you keep getting is just handfuls of bitter and sour or maybe even rotting things, as long as it doesn't turn into ash in your mouth, you think that it's something sweet. Wow. Why is that? Because you're just so desperate for anything. Abomination will turn you into something that you've never even thought that you could be 
doesn't resemble who you used to be. And on the inside, if we could see as God sees, because man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh on the heart. If we could open you up, you look like one of them little like Jamaican shrunken head dolls where everything's there, but it's withered and it's tight and it's tall. And there's, if you moved, you'd break. Why? Because you've robbed yourself of all the things that used to give you life and now there's nothing out there that can give you life. But you fill yourself with it and it just keeps sucking more and more out of you to the point where one day you become ash. You just wither away. Why does that happen? Because God's the one that keeps everything in order. In order. Keeps our planet in orbit. Keeps the sun coming up. By His Word, everything is done. So when you reject His Word, everything in your life that He used to keep in order, if you go against it, if you don't hear it, you just begin withering away. Because you're without the one that gives life. Not just eternal life and life more abundantly. No, no, no. He breathed in the man the breath of life. So if you cut God off, what do you think is going to happen? That's not God's choice. That's yours. You chose to leave. Abomination will lead to destruction sooner or later. Some people find out that that cliff was a whole lot closer than they thought. But others walk across the desert only to find out in the end that they're just going to turn into sand themselves. Abomination. Not something that God would have us do just a little bit different. Right? Not something that, well, he's still working on me. And we haven't gotten to that yet. No, no, no. Not that. Not what well, I'm... Granted, I messed up. But I understood I messed up, so I got it made right. Not talking about that. Talking every day, tuning out what God would have you to hear. Every day, justifying how you can stay where you are and still be right with God. Every day, rejecting the very call and plea of the Spirit, just come back to God. Abomination. Not my opinion. It's what God said. And if you really want to have the fear of God put into you, we ran out of time. Go look at all the things that God's done to abomination. And then get in an altar as quick as you can and pray that God doesn't let it happen to you. Right? Because He is merciful. He does forgive. You may still have to pay the consequence. But I'd rather get it made right and have to deal with the consequences at the Father's house then deal with the consequences on my own. All right, that's it. We'll take a short break. Get ready for worship. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.